Hello everyone, this is installment for patrons of the history of the United States in 100 objects, and this will be number 15 on the John Winthrop Jr. Alchemical Physician's Chair. So just to lay out what this thing is, it's a large wainscot chair or great chair made of oak carved with iconographic ornaments produced by an unknown maker, most likely in Connecticut, somewhere between 1660 and 1675. This chair belonged to John Winthrop Jr., who was a physician and governor of the colony of Connecticut, and it is today in the collection of the Connecticut Historical Society. So this chair was in the property and estate of John Winthrop Jr. when he died in the 1670s. He died in 1676 at the age of 70, while still in office as governor and while serving as a director of the United Colonies of New England during King Philip's War. So who was John Winthrop Jr. and why would this particular chair have been produced for him as it almost surely was? Well, he was the son of John Winthrop Sr., naturally enough, who was a Puritan minister and the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So he came from probably the most powerful and prestigious family in early New England and was very much woven into power, politics, and religion in New England in the 17th century. He was born and raised in England, and he studied various different fields, including briefly studying law at the Inner Temple in London. But he went abroad, and it seems that he was fervently interested in travel and exploration beyond England. He took part in the failed English exhibition that attempted to support the Protestants at La Rochelle when they were being besieged and threatened by the Catholic government of Louis XIII. And after the failure of that undertaking, he continued on and traveled reportedly to Italy and the Middle East before then returning to England. And then quickly after that, he set sail and went to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where he arrived in 1631, so just a year after the initial creation of Boston and other Puritan towns around Boston. So as seems to be the pattern with John Winthrop Jr., he kind of conveniently missed the hardest part uh, the most difficult crisis, which was, you know, that initial landing in 1630, but he showed up in time to sort of participate in the project afterwards. He immediately, by virtue of his birth and his learning and experience, he immediately became a prominent colonist and was elected as an assistant or one of the legislators in the upper house of the Massachusetts Bay Colony several times over the 1630s. He also acted as one of the organizers and founders of the town of Agawam, north of Boston, which is today known as Ipswich. In 1635, he obtained a patent authorizing him to colonize the mouth of the Connecticut River. So basically, within the kind of broad range of what could be considered the territory of Massachusetts Bay, but pretty far removed from that original core around Boston. And so he created a town called Saybrook, which is today known as Old Saybrook, right at the mouth of the Connecticut River on Long Island Sound. So really at the outer edge of ambiguous disputed territory, really, between the English colonizers, the indigenous people, and the Dutch, who claimed the entire area around the Hudson. In 1637, New England engaged in a war against the Pequot Nation, the main powerful nation around the Connecticut River Valley and the area that we today know as Connecticut. And again, uh, John Winthrop Jr. was kind of conveniently away and not caught up in that war personally, but it ended up in 
the destruction of most of the Pequot nation and their elimination as a significant military power. And in the kind of land bonanza that followed, the colony granted an island called Fisher's Island uh, on the coast of the Long Island Sound, granted it as a sort of personal fiefdom to John Winthrop Jr. in 1640. So he now had a kind of bit of territory of his own under his personal control. Also, around the same time, an antinomian controversy broke out in Boston, where certain leaders, particularly Anne Hutchinson, pushed the boundaries of what the Puritan ministry considered acceptable doctrine, particularly in the direction of antinomianism, basically the idea that if a person has been saved and they have assurance, if they've received something they call the seal of the spirit that assures them that they are saved, then the law no longer applies to them. They are, in a sense, incapable of sin and above the biblical law. So when this controversy broke out, again, Winthrop was conveniently out of town. And it's widely understood among historians that he intentionally absented himself and the other ministers around Massachusetts Bay allowed him to sort of stay out of this controversy, probably because John Winthrop Jr. was more sympathetic to antinomianism and to Anne Hutchinson's point of view than the other Puritan leaders of the colony. And so he was sort of conveniently uh, out of this dispute. And more and more, instead of actively involving himself in Massachusetts Bay politics, instead, he, Winthrop, it seems, settled into life in this far outpost in Connecticut, and he intensely studied sciences, you know, in quotation marks, the sort of esoteric disciplines of knowledge that were popular at this time in the 1600s, at least among certain circles, most particularly alchemy, and he became a very active alchemist. In the 1640s, he also undertook sort of business developments that you could see as in line with his alchemical quest. He began ironworks at the towns of Saugus and Braintree in Massachusetts Bay, and he tried to raise further funds and investment to explore and mine more mineral deposits around New England, especially in Connecticut. In 1645, he was given a further patent to colonize southeastern Connecticut, so this kind of zone in between Saybrook in the west and the Rhode Island colony in the east. And in 1646, the town of New London was founded, basically right on the site of what had been a Pequot village called Namayog. And sometimes that name was still used for this town before New London became the prevalent name for it. In 1650, John Winthrop Jr. permanently moved to New London and opened a mill. And the following year, in 1651, he became a magistrate of this kind of new makeshift colony that had taken shape under his leadership. So at this point, you had various kind of outposts pressing southward and southwestward out of what was Massachusetts Bay into this zone we now call Connecticut. There was Hartford and New Haven, both you know, Puritan extensions of New England. And then there were these other smaller settlements at Saybrook and New London. And there was a kind of confused and ambiguous situation, whether each of these was a separate colony unto itself, whether they were simply part of Massachusetts Bay, but had to govern themselves separately because they were too far from Boston. And Basically, John Winthrop Jr. becomes a magistrate in New London and starts trying to kind of negotiate and patch together a kind of political settlement of what all of these colonies would be and how they would operate. In 1655, he relocated from New London to New Haven in order to develop an ironworks, so another iron foundry there. 
and in 1659, he was elected as governor of this entire area of all of these colonies in what we now call Connecticut. So more and more, they're operating de facto as a kind of separate colony of them, their own that had hived off from Massachusetts Bay. And he takes up this office of governor, and he served in that capacity continuously until his death in 1676, so for 17 years. And he lived mainly in Hartford, where this new colonial government was centered. During his time as governor, he took several somewhat controversial steps in the direction towards, you could say, some semblance of tolerance or pluralism. He allowed Quakers to settle and live peaceably in Connecticut, although the Congregational Church was still the established state-supported church. Nonetheless, Quakers were able to live there. He also uh, discouraged and suppressed witchcraft trials and took a similar tack to other colonial leaders like Roger Williams, who basically argued that witchcraft either was not real or even if it was, it was it was a spiritual matter, not something for the state to treat as a criminal matter. And he tried to deal with political crises, like what would be part of this new Connecticut entity and what would be Rhode Island and what would be Massachusetts, territorial disputes, authority disputes, and the delicate situation that arose from the Restoration. So Connecticut had formed as a sort of improvised colony in the 1630s and 40s, and in the 1650s, the protectorate the or Commonwealth government dominated by Puritans had kind of turned a blind eye and basically allowed the New England colonies to do whatever they wanted. But in 1660, the monarchy came back to power, and under Charles II, it was unclear what sort of policies would be reversed and what would be accepted. And so it was unclear whether the new restoration government would simply treat Connecticut as illegal, as a colony that had not been authorized by a charter from England. That was a real problem. And so Winthrop went to England, and he was able to network and schmooze with the sort of high-status circles connected to the king and the Restoration Court, including some Puritans. Not all Puritans had a hostile relationship with Charles II. And eventually he was able to, you know, get a good hearing at the royal court and was able to obtain a formal charter uniting all of these various colonies that had been called Connecticut, like Hartford, Saybrook, New London, together with New Haven, and to sort of formally found them as the new colony of Connecticut on its own footing separate from Massachusetts Bay. He also became a member of the Royal Society. So that special group that had been formed right at the same time as the Restoration with these luminaries like Ashmole and Murray and Hook. And he was the first person residing in the colonies to become a member of the Royal Society. So that happened pretty quickly. Now, you might remember previously when I talked about the scientific revolution, I mentioned Cotton Mather and said he was the first colonist in the Royal Society. Well, strictly speaking, he was the first one born in the colonies to become a member of the Royal Society. But Winthrop was a colonist and colonial official who be also became a member of the Royal Society earlier. In 1664, he was back in Connecticut, and he took part and helped the English takeover of New Netherlands. So this was the final seizure of that whole colony stretching from New York Harbor up the Hudson that we now know as New York, because after the English took it over, it was handed over as a kind of personal fiefdom to James, the Duke of York. And after that point, after 1664, it really seems that he tried very hard to get out of politics and to focus fully on his studies and on his businesses, but he was prevented. The Connecticut colony kept electing him governor over and over again uh, against his wishes <laughs> and out of 
Out of ego or out of a sense of duty, he continued to serve, it seems, and somehow managed to balance his intellectual and scientific pursuits and his business enterprises and politics. He also, it seems, at times tried to manage affairs with the Native Americans and keep peace with what was left of the Pequot nation. And ultimately, in 1675, when war breaks out between a, an Indian confederation and New England, he serves as a director of the United Colonies. And eventually, he died in Boston during the middle of that war in 1676. So if we look into Winthrop's career, as some historians have done, you can see him as a kind of magus, right? This, this persona that I spoke about in my last lecture about astrology a few weeks ago, the sort of wise man who knows the sort of hidden structures and secrets of the universes and through this uh, secret wisdom can perform kind of feats and miracles. That seems to be the kind of person that Winthrop really strove to be and how some people perceived him. He had an enormous library with thousands of titles, probably the biggest or at least one of the biggest in the colonies. He had an exceptionally fine three and a half foot long telescope through which he made very close observations and among them he reported sighting a fifth moon of Jupiter beyond just the four Galilean moons that are easiest to see. And it's uncertain whether he was entirely correct about this or if it was a mistake, but regardless, about 200 years later, observers were able to confirm that there was at least that fifth visible moon of Jupiter. So maybe his, his observation was correct and hundreds of years ahead of its time. He collected and examined natural artifacts and specimens from America, which was a common pursuit for naturalists and wise men in the Americas. A lot of the knowledge, of course, they were getting from indigenous people and, and people on the ground, but they saw it as their job to kind of translate and catalog this knowledge to send back to Europe, and he sent many interesting specimens back to England, some of which made quite an impression. Possibly the biggest was milkweed. This was something unknown in Europe, and apparently the Royal Society was impressed and fascinated, and even the king was fascinated by milkweed and demanded that a pillow be made stuffed with milkweed, but it just uh, wasn't feasible. But most importantly of all, Winthrop was self-trained as a physician a physical doctor. He traveled and treated patients all around Connecticut, probably about 500 families he acted as a kind of primary care physician for. He also treated many more people in an even broader area, far and wide, by mixing medicines of various sorts and putting them into packets of pills to send out. And he had a kind of team of assistants to help him uh, produce and process and distribute these medicines. And so all in all, he was able to treat an average of about 12 patients a day. So an exceptionally productive doctor. No, you know, certainly he had a reputation of being effective. We don't know exactly how effective. And like many physicians of the time, he intensely studied astrology in order to time and aim when the different medicines should be produced, of what materials, and when they should be administered. You know, there was a notion that different uh, heavenly bodies had influences on different parts of the human body. There were correspondences, say, between uh, the head and the moon, etc., and also natural substances, minerals and plants, were also influenced by the movements of the heavens. But as I said, he particularly intensely studied alchemy, and combined alchemy with medicine, as many people did in these years following in the wake after Paracelsus. He was an intense reader of popular alchemists like Jacob Burma and Robert Flood, all of which were in his library, of course. And he explored and did chemical experiments himself, you know, tests on 
the makeup and the transmutation of different minerals, these tests that were called at the time assays or trials. And he organized New London to be an alchemical colony. That was the idea, that uh, colonists would go up the Thames River in this eastern end of Connecticut and would search for firstly lead deposits, which were already known to be abundant in that area, and hopefully also find other mineral deposits that sometimes occurred together with lead, such as silver. And he would set up ironworks and mines and basically use them as alchemical laboratories. And he hoped that he would be able to bring alchemists over from Europe, particularly from the Hartlib circle, this sort of circle of alchemical philosophers that he'd been in communication with in England. And he was not able to persuade any of them to come to Connecticut, but he did attract other active alchemists from other areas of the colonies, such as, for instance, Jonathan Brewster from the Plymouth Colony and the minister Gershom Bulkley from Massachusetts Bay, both of whom were active alchemists, and they went to New London and cooperated with him. And all kinds of undertakings that they attempted around New London, such as extracting salt from seawater, were also, in their view, extensions of their alchemical quest. And at one point, Jonathan Brewster, while he was living elsewhere in Connecticut, actually thought that he maybe had come up with the elixir of life, the sort of great medical cure-all that was one of the goals of alchemy, one of the overarching goals, but, you know, didn't work out. Now, he, of course, applied his alchemy to medicine, right? So he was an alchemical physician. He rejected the humoral theory of Galen and that school of thought. He argued that, or he subscribed to the idea that the key to health is not balance of humors, but rather chemical changes, changes in the body from one substance to another. And the medicines that he produced and distributed were chemical rather than the kinds of herbal medicines that were more normal for Galenic physicians like purgatives. Part of the idea of alchemy and of chemistry, as we now know it, is that quantity is the, the effects of a medicine do not change in a linear fashion with quantity. It's not the case that if you want an effect from a certain pill or elixir and you want it to be triple as strong, you just triple the amount, right? Different doses and different amounts can have dramatically different effects, and even infinitesimally small amounts of the right substance might trigger a chemical change that totally reverses the state of the body. And what that meant is that he believed that even tiny amounts of his medications could have the curative effects that he wanted. And that's why he was able to mass produce and mass distribute these medicines to thousands of people all around southern New England, because in a sense, there was no limit to what even a tiny quantity could do. So he had a really dramatic, wide-ranging impact. So, okay, so those are important things to know about this fellow, John Winthrop Jr. What does this chair have to do with it? Uh, isn't it just a sort of nice decorated oak chair like you would see in any number of well-to-do colonial homes? Well, it may be more than that. And I think it's reasonable to say that there's a lot more meaning packed into this chair than initially meets the eye if you don't know what you're looking for. So it is, as I said, a wainscot chair in the sort of heavy 17th century style. You know, it's, it's basically restoration style, kind of bold ornaments that take up the entire surface that are meant to be impressive and imposing. But what do we know about it? Who made it? We actually don't know who produced it. Uh, one historian who's discussed the chair, near Neil Camel, theorizes that it was produced by John Elderkin, a builder who lived in New London. 
and who was an English Puritan and a master builder who oversaw things like the creation of John Winthrop Jr.'s mill at New London. But this identification is rejected by some other scholars. For instance, the Chipstone Foundation, which owns some of John Elderkin's other work, does not believe that it was that he was the maker. Rather, they think that it was probably made by Dutch craftsmen in New York, who are also known to be fine furniture makers and supplied a lot of the best furniture around the North American colonies. Well, what does it matter? What makes this attribution important, whether it was Elderkin or someone else? Why argue over it? As I said, it seems fairly typical of a great chair of the Restoration period, except the turned ornamentation on the chair back is unusual. So along the top edge, there's a simple arcade of seven little rounded arches, almost like an arcade on a Romanesque monastery. So not too unusual, but it suggests that there's, it's framing something important. Something on the chair back is significant, maybe religiously significant, to be paid attention to. And inside the, the chair back, sort of facing a person looking at the chair, there is an arrangement of 13 identical carved rosettes which is a little unusual. You know, it's not a vine work pattern. It's, a, it's not a scene. It's these 13 carved rosettes. And they seem to be in some kind of special configuration. There's one in the center. And around that one in the center, there are three plain circular rings. And then around that, there are eight further rosettes in a ring. And then outside that ring, there are four more rosettes in the four corners. So what could this mean? Is there a reason for this pattern? Well, the one in the center, which seems to sort of stand out, set apart from the others, as if it's in the foreground, that one is, as I said, set apart. And then there are 12 others arranged, you could say, in the background around it. And that configuration mimics alchemical drawings such as the illustration in Robert Flood's book of the circle of urinary colors. So it was not uncommon for alchemists to make these sort of wheel-shaped charts showing a ring of little circles, each with a different color representing a different state of health, which in some way is connected to or influenced by a different heavenly body, maybe a planet or a sign of the zodiac. And in, in the case of Flood, he, he is looking at the different colors of urine that a physician might take from a patient and how to interpret that for what it says about the chemical makeup and the health of the patient. So this is a connection that, uh, that Neil Camel points out. And furthermore, as I said, that central rosette in the middle has three simple rings carved around it. What does that mean? Well, it suggests that this central rosette represents the sun with planets going around it. And the Earth, of course, is the third planet around the sun if you subscribe to the Copernican system, as some of the leading thinkers of this time did. So there's some, it's saying something about the relation or the connection between the sun and the Earth among these other heavenly bodies around them. And it seems to mimic astrological charts that you see in the astrological books and manuals of this time, like the ones that John Winthrop Jr. had in his library. So if we go beyond that central rosette and the three rings around it, which maybe represent the sun and the inner planets as far as the earth, what are these other 12 arranged around the outside, well, those may represent the 12 signs of the zodiac. Or certainly a configuration of 12 is always very religiously suggestive. You know, it evokes the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, and in this case, probably also the 12 signs of the zodiac that separate out the sections of the sky around the sun and earth. Now, notice how this apparently astrological or alchemical design is placed on the back of this great chair. If the central rosette, as we said, represents the sun, 
it's located directly behind what would be the heart of the person sitting in the chair. And there's a common alchemical and astrological belief in a correspondence or link between the sun and the human heart. These are two sort of centers of power and energy and heat that in some way are linked together. You know, just as I said, the, the different planets might have special influences on the hands or the feet. So the sun is believed to be linked to the heart. And hence, the chair not only is communicating a certain scheme or idea in its design, it's probably a kind of talisman designed to channel that power or that life force from the sun through the alchemical design itself to the heart of the physician who is sitting in the chair. And hence, from there, the physician can channel that power or life force through the parts of his body, which correspond to the different zodiacal signs, which are also represented on the chair, and hence channel them into the medicine or the medical operation that the physician is performing, and from there into the patient. Right? So you can see it as almost a kind of astrological machine guiding and empowering the treatment of this patient and healing the patient. So all of this might sound a little weird or a little far-fetched as a process happening in Puritan colonial Connecticut. And it is rather surprising that there is this kind of whole alternative world going on in such a kind of <laughs> bland, <laughs> generic New England town as New London, this kind of alchemical furor happening around John Winthrop Jr. But the historian uh, Walter Woodward, in his book Prospero's America, makes this argument very strenuously that there was a sort of powerful and influential alchemical underground going on, particularly in eastern Connecticut surrounding Winthrop, whom he compares, of course, to, to Prospero, to this kind of archetypal figure of the wise Magus that you see in Shakespeare's The Tempest. And the fact that Winthrop had these sorts of views and interests was a little bit problematic in Massachusetts Bay. And there are texts surviving, like letters from John Winthrop Sr., where he warns John Jr., you know, beware of getting too deeply into alchemy. Don't think that this wisdom and knowledge is somehow going to save you. Don't get puffed up with knowledge. Remember that it's only God's grace that saves you. So there was a little bit of friction sometimes between this alchemical quest and the views and assumptions that go with it and orthodox mainstream puritanism on the other. And that's probably part of why John Jr. withdrew and went into, you know, got involved in these Connecticut colonies and no longer was subject to the authority of Massachusetts Bay. You know, he was getting away from his father and from the Puritan divines of Massachusetts Bay. His removal to New London, you can see as part of a broader pattern, which was forming by this time, that there was a kind of broad area, a broad region, and other historians have pointed this out, a sort of swath of New England running from the Plymouth Colony and Cape Cod and New Bedford through all of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations and into eastern Connecticut, where there was a great deal of heterodoxy. The authorities either were weaker or they were less interested in investigating and enforcing orthodoxy. And so there were a lot of alternative ideas. There was, it seems, wide interest in sorcery and divination, in the occult arts, and in kind of more radical and mystical versions of Protestantism, particularly antinomianism. So there's this antinomian idea that a person who is saved is freed from the law. The law no longer applies to them. They're incapable of sin. And also sometimes connected with antinomianism, there is perfectionism. So the idea that it is possible for a person to perfect himself or herself and become completely free of sin and in, in a sense become almost a divine being. And this, of course, is in conflict with the more mainstream Reformed Protestant notion that 
You are afflicted with original sin. You are unable to overcome your sinfulness except with God's grace. So these sorts of, you could say, controversial ideas circulate a lot, sometimes underground, sometimes they come out into the open. There was the Samuel Gorton episode in Rhode Island. In a way, you can see John Winthrop Jr. and his interest in alchemy as connected to that, and often alchemy and perfectionism can be very connected. Uh, in, in, for instance, there was an influential mystical alchemist in England called John Everard, who was a committed antinomian and who used alchemy as a kind of model or metaphor for the perfection of the soul, right? Alchemy is about transmutation, the creation of gold or pure, permanent substances out of corrupt substances. Well, Everard saw that as a perfect parallel for the, the purging of the soul and the creation of, of a perfect person. And John Winthrop Jr. actually met with Everard when he was in England in the 1660s, although he was not very happy with the meeting because Everard kept being like very moony and mystical and unclear about his views. So Winthrop kind of got tired of him. But clearly there was some affinity there and some mutual interest. And this interest in alchemy, in perfectionism, in antinomianism was part of the foundation of Connecticut, especially New London itself. And there was a sort of movement also of denominations of Protestant groups and sects that formed in the colonies and then spread both in Rhode Island and in eastern Connecticut in this area under Winthrop's influence. For instance, Seventh-day Baptists, which formed in Newport and then spread and, and brought their message westward into Connecticut. And also Quakers, right? Qu Quakers were able to settle freely all around Rhode Island and Connecticut. And sometimes these different ideas, these alchemical and mystical ideas, could combine and intercombine with just Quakerism. Winthrop was friends with Roger Williams. They were on very friendly terms, despite the fact that Winthrop's own father was one of the Puritan ministers who expelled Roger Williams from Massachusetts. And both of them, they had similar attitudes, allowing a wide degree of free thought in their colonies, uh, discouraging or completely banning the prosecution of witches, you know, regarding witchcraft as something that was not real or just not a matter for law to deal with. So Winthrop you know, you could say he was soft on witches, and basically he was able to shut down kind of the last witch prosecutions in Connecticut in the 1660s, and no, no more happened anymore after his time in office. Winthrop was able to get Roger Williams' help in recruiting John Elderkin. So John Elderkin, this builder, he was in Providence, and Winthrop solicited Williams' help in pressuring John Elderkin to move to New London and help build this kind of alchemical colony. And Elderkin also built the first merchant vessel to be constructed in Connecticut, and it was called the New London Trial. And as I said, this word trial was one of the common words at that time for an alchemical test or experiment. So it seems likely that in some way Elderkin was drawn in to this kind of alchemical project in New London. And this area continued to be a something of a hotbed of heterodox spiritualism and perfectionism even after Winthrop was gone. So depending on exactly how you measure and define, Arguably, the first new religious group or new religious sect to arise in colonial America was the so-called Rogerines, which began in, in and around New London, led by a man named John Rogers, a sort of radical lay preacher named John Rogers in New London in 1674. And it seems that initially Rogers, his views were influenced by Seventh-day Baptists who were migrating from Newport over into Connecticut and spreading their message that to be biblically correct, you should observe the Sabbath on the seventh day, Saturday, not Sunday. And Rogers took this idea and went a radical step further and argued that there really shouldn't be any 
observance of, uh, observance of the Sabbath, and you should treat every day as equally holy, and that the, the notion of not working on the Sabbath, in fact, was biblically incorrect. It had been superseded by the, the New Testament, the Gospel of Christ, which freed Christians from observing the Old Testament laws. So there's a certain logic there, but it, you can see how it was taken as, as radical and heretical. They were frequently arrested and punished, not necessarily for preaching their message, but for intentionally provoking their neighbors by doing things like working on the Sabbath and driving animals and, and merchandise into town on Sundays as a way of sort of openly and aggressively flouting the norms around the Sabbath. So the Rogerines, as I said, were arguably the first new religious group to form in North America. And in this way, from this point onward, you can see that the American colonies were not just a refuge. You know, that's sort of the, the main story that we like to tell, that persecuted people of persecuted faiths in Europe could go to America as a refuge from persecution. But in fact, after not very long, the colonies really became a hotbed of new ideas and new religions that could arise and then be persecuted <laughs> by the other religious groups and establishments in the colonies. And a lot of these new religious ideas that developed and found new audiences in the colonies were inflected with perfectionism, with this idea of overcoming sinful human nature and becoming perfect. And the historian John Brooke has argued that you can see the Rogerines as an early instance of this pattern arising in America, which eventually, in his view, culminates in the formation of Mormonism in the 19th century, which is a perfectionist form of Christianity. So in this way, I think you can see the John Winthrop Jr. chair is an interesting convergence of kind of classic, familiar New England or New York colonial artisanship, the two materials for artwork that the colonists did have plenty of access to were wood and silver. Others like textiles and glass were very rare and hard to obtain, especially in these early years in the 1600s. But there was wood and silver, and you can see brilliant styles and craftsmanship taking shape in those media, even in these early colonial years. But in the case of this chair, the unusual design and the apparent references and possibly coded meanings in this chair. They not only reflect this kind of more hidden or underground esoteric strain of thinking, but they actually reflect people's desire and people's efforts to actively use and channel hidden powers, hidden powers of the universe, which they understand through astrology or alchemy or the doctrine of sympathies and correspondences. So thank you so much uh, for listening, and hopefully soon I'll have another installment uh, publicly available on the colonial West Indies, and maybe some of these same sorts of ideas or patterns will come up there too. We'll see. Thank you.